All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, I see people are coming in here. Let me go ahead and throw up the first poll. And Katrina, if you want to add any color to it. Um, we just want to see where the audience is before we start, before we influence your ideas at all. Let's see where you are at in the beginning. So as folks are coming on, um, I see numbers are continuing to go up. You'll see a, a poll there. Go ahead and fill that in. Um, and welcome back to its peer-to-peer -peer world virtual conference. We're going to get started here in just a moment. Going to start out with this poll, though. Everybody gets a chance. I like this poll. Like there's, you know, you might think absolutely is a typo, but that's just more absolutely, like bigger than absolutely. Now uh, that's me with uh, typing with cold medicine in my system. That's what oh, that is. is quite right. <laughs> like they're, just, they're just like slips. That's, uh, I, I like absolutely. I'm going to use it from now on. Terrific. <laughs> Every time I see you in conference. Absolutely. <laughs> Should we move on to the second poll question or you want to give it another moment? Well, let's get to the second. This gives me a good sense of where people are. Should we share the results too or? Let's do that. Oh We're at 55% absolutely. <laughs> Jeez. And then not is 2%. No, you can't stop. I went through a period of my life when I couldn't say the word in, interpret. It was interpret because that's the way it ought to be, right? Nice. When you get to the next one up here. Oops. All right. There's poll question number two. <laughs> Give folks just another moment to finish that one and we'll go on to number three here in a second. And for the people who answered yes, it would be very interesting. Let's all play in the chat today so we all see what each other says. It'd be very interesting to hear some of that language, like um, how does the strategic plan talk about community building? Mm -hmm. So feel free to share. And also in the chat, feel free to let us know where you're listening in from. And Mark, I can't see the chat. Oh, wait, there it is. I take that back. I'm going to end this poll and share the results <clears throat> with everybody. All right, that's good news. And then move on to poll number three. I kind of like to run these all again at the end to see if we move any. That would be fascinating. And there's poll number three. And Mark, I'm not sure why, but I, I cannot read the chat, so it'll be up to you to manage that. Okay. Got a lot of people putting in where they're from and our value, uh, Melanie says our values include power of many and every voice matters. And we outline which of our values our strategies align. <laughs> Okay, great. So at the end of this, it'll be interesting. Let's go back to some of those and say, you know, with this uh, potential reframe of community, do you still feel the answer is yes? Or do you feel the strategic plan has addressed it in a sufficient fashion? All right. I think we're good. Nice. <clears throat> All right, again, welcome everybody to uh, It's a Peer-to-Peer -peer World, uh, third session of the day. It's midday here in uh, Florida, uh, one o'clock. And um, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. 
I am uh, your MC, uh, Mark Becker, founding partner of Cathexis Partners. There's a horrible picture of me. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> glad to be here and glad to listen to uh, the turnkey folks uh, chat today. Always great insights um, to be shared. So let's move on to the next slide and talk about our hosts, um, which include Cathexis Partners, Tatango, um, Duclavis, Event360, and of course, Turnkey. Um, and we're all very happy to be able to host this and provide this uh, conference to you at no charge today. Um, hopefully you get a lot out of it today. So um, thank you for everybody attending and thank you for everybody hosting. And I also wanted to give a shout out on the next slide to our media partner, Nonprofit Pro. It's been great in helping evangelize and share um, that this conference is happening and some of the, the uh, resources from it. So thank you to them as well. And then um, moving on to the next slide. Um, there's the overall schedule. Hopefully you've signed up for all the different sessions going on throughout the day. Uh, if you happen to miss any or don't aren't able to because of the conflict, we are going to be recording all these sessions. We're also going to be sharing the slides um, and uh, recording the sessions and sharing them out. Probably, I think it's tomorrow. Uh, you'll receive an email if you register for any of these. And if you're on this call now, register for at least one. So you'll get all those. Uh, without any further ado, let me hand it over to Katrina. All right. Thanks, everyone, and welcome. I'm Katrina Van Huss. I'm the founder at Turnkey. Um, and today we're going to be talking about how community works, what it produces, and those two things are about system and process. So it's not really going to be a unicorns and butterflies kind of conversation. It's going to be a science and math kind of conversation. Um, we'll talk about why we in nonprofit um, may have failed it building community in a real sense. And then we'll move to the Pediatric Brain Tumor Foundation and their experience with community. So I thought I had one more slide where I introduced everyone. Let me do that now. Um, Otis Fulton is with us. He's a PhD in social psychology and the VP of psychological strategy at Turnkey. And Emily, I'm going to mess up your title, but Emily's the one who does all the digital fundraising, most of the community engagement and somehow birthed a community uh, in a very different, special way. Say hi, Emily. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm glad you're here. Thank All you. right. So this is our um, title, and uh, you've seen that because you signed up. There's that darn slide. There's a director of digital engagement and fundraising. Yep. Yeah, that's a better way to say it for sure. <laughs> That. Um, we're really happy to have Otis with us today. It's his first outing since acquiring two new pieces of, of metal in his knees. He is a double knee uh, replacement survivor. Glad that you're with us, Otis. Thank you. All right. So let's move into this thing. Um, I'm fairly normal. Um, Otis might disagree. He is my husband, by the way. So if you don't know us, we will behave in odd ways and interrupt each other an awful lot. But there's Otis. Uh, we're in our home in the suburbs. I garden. I compost. This is my son and his lovely wife, Jody. My son Giles came to me four or five years ago and he said, hey, mom, let's do something together every Wednesday night. Now, if you have kids and they're grown, this is not an offer you get very often. So I was like, I'm a yes. I don't care what it is. And so he came back to me in a week or two and he said, all right, mom, I've got the thing that we're going to do on Wednesdays jujitsu and I'm like sounds pretty like a flower uh mm -hmm. it was pretty like a flower it was this sweaty smelly uh as in close proximity as you can get to people but you know what you just don't get this chance with your kids very often so I said yes so every Wednesday night I would put on my gi and we would go and we would roll which is what you call jujitsu practice and I really really hated it at first, but I really, really loved being with my kid. And then I started making friends at the gym. You know, there was a women's group. Um, we were at the gym at first one time a week and then two or three times a week. Sometimes we went to other gyms together and we rolled with other women. We had a Facebook group that was going. Um, they became really important to me. And so the things they did became the things I did. And that's how at the age of 60, I ended up here doing something that in the moment 
felt entirely normal, but you're looking at this picture going, girl, what is wrong with you? You are too old to be doing this. And you're right, I was. But anyway, it all worked out because this felt normal for me inside my community. It felt perfectly average. And we're going to talk about how that works. But first, Emily, you too have gotten out there a little bit. Tell us what is it that you do that's a little out of the norm? Absolutely. So um, my background um, prior to nonprofit work has been in um, uh Healthcare nonprofit work has been in um, arts administration and theater. So um, that took me all over the US um, uh, in my 20s. Um, and one of those jobs was with the Sundance Film Festival. Um, through that job, um, I um, met my husband, the brunette man in this picture. Um, and he happened to have two great friends, Larissa and Steve, the other two people that are in this picture. Um, and my husband works in TV and film. Um, Larissa was the person who gave him his first job um, in Hollywood when he moved out to LA. Um, and Steve is um, a gaffer. Um, Steve and Larissa also happen to be married now after meeting on a TV show. Well, we all formed this like little network and community of best friendship. Um, and um, collectively, we all moved to Georgia together um, and we raise our kids together. And we're a great, great, um, they're, they're a great sort of um, uh, set of friends that have become family for us. Well, with this shared interest and shared um, passion for all things art, TV, film, um, Larissa um, and Steve started their own production company. And so Mike and I um, work alongside them to now develop um, scripts for TV. Um, uh, and um, we work collaboratively. We meet every Sunday night. Um, there's six of us across the country meet via Zoom and we share works together. We uh, give each other ideas. We, we um, critique each other's pitch packets um, and we work um, as a collective of creatives together to really um, um, hopefully drive the next thing you see on TV. So um, we're really excited to see what comes from that. Um, and that's that's sort of my hobby job um, outside of this. Um, but yeah, we just, um, we've created this little commune of support and love, um, all based around this TV and film world that the three of them work in every day. And I dabble in because of my, my passions and background. So when you go home for Thanksgiving and you're yeah. sitting at the Thanksgiving table and they say, so tell us what you're doing. And you start talking about this. Do you get that little squ squinty eyed? Like, Really? You know? Not at, not at all, because this is so much ingrained into who we were before we were adults. I mean, we were the kids that, you know, um, mm -hmm. would create movies as teenagers and write stuff um, as stories as kids and reenact them. So no one is surprised at all in our family that we also do this. OK, so you're accepted there. Well, I can tell you that Otis and I were surprised, you know, because <laughs> we had that coming. I reached out and I'm like, tell me one crazy thing you do. And you, and this is what you came back with. Yep. Um, so for your small community of people, these artists, um, yep. what you do is the norm, the social norm, so to speak. Yes. So what, yes, this is absolutely. And, and like I said, the three of them actually work in it. So this is their day to day. My husband runs a big studio here in Atlanta. Larissa is a producer um, and Steve works alongside her on all her shows. So we're like interconnected into this space. It's very normal and it's very part. Of, it's very much a part of who we are. Every party has people from this world. Um, and that's, I feel like that's all we talk about generally um, at social events. But yes, we're very much ingrained in this space. So me and my jujitsu and you in, in entertainment mm -hmm. be comparable to those $10,000 fundraisers because this yep. is who we are. This is what we do. Yep. So I want to move forward here. So one of the things both you and I hit heavily here is that in our community, highlighting the big clue here is that we communicate with each other. Not so much that my gym emails me or calls me or talks to me and then I talk back to my gym, but I talk to my gym members. And likewise, you are communicating with your community. So that is the big thing that we're talking about, the with each other part, not with the organization, not with the mission, not with our boss, but with each other, the people in the community. And Otis, could I go to you and could you tell us why that works? What is it about us talking to each other within the community that is so powerful? Sure, you know, social psychologists, I'm a social psychologist, have been studying community for decades now. And um, 
you know, the relationship between community and identity is important to understand uh, in order to build these communities. Um, in fact, this is the topic of Trina uh, in our, our next book. Um, so here's, here's kind of the big idea in a nutshell. Uh, people seek out groups of other people who share their, their values, their interests, their ideas, just, just like we were talking about a moment ago. And so what groups we choose to be a part of, it's a big component of how we see ourselves. So Emily sees herself as a creative person who pitches uh, TV shows. Uh, I'm a UVA alumni. I'm a member of the American Psychological Association, et cetera, et cetera. So we en engage with people in the community who share some of our values or ideas. And, you know, if the gr if this group is a good fit for us, uh, these, uh, ac these, these interactions, uh, they reinforce our identity. And the result is what's called a social validation feedback loop. Uh, the more we engage, the more our identity is reinforced. It's it's validated who we are, and and being validated by others is very very rewarding to people. And so these positive interactions they they further strengthen your identity, and that makes you more likely to engage. And so the wheel just goes round and round. And now it feels perfectly normal for Katrina to compete in jujitsu competition at when she's sixty years old. So. Um, Whenever members of your community validate your identity, uh, it tells you uh, these people are like me and what I'm doing is something good. So these interactions with members of the community build trust and that trust extends to promoting the value or the idea that you share in Katrina's case that, you know, that an old person staying strong is something that's important. And building trust in the community requires the opportunity um, to interact with community members. And that's why nonprofit communities need to be more than just a collection of people with some common idea or, you know, or, or belief. Um, they, they need to be more than an email list. They also have to have the ability to communicate with each other. And, you know, the with each other is the most important part of that sentence. You know, Katrina could have watched mixed martial arts a lot on television and, and never competed. So just to kind of wrap up, you know, research shows that people are likely to behave positively towards people they trust and, and, and also people that they like. Liking and trust are two things that are highly correlated. So the more you like someone, the more you tend to trust them and vice versa. So, you know, it turns out that trust in the community is, is actionable. It makes you more likely to behave in a way uh, that supports the community and its goals. So, um, when a community member, maybe it's someone you've never even met, asks you to do something, you're much more likely to comply and say yes in these high trust communities. So in the best case scenario, it's not the organization that drives the mission, but the people in the community. And and I, I, know, uh, I know I've said a lot here, but we're writing a whole book on it. So it, it, it is a lot. Next one, Katrina. So here's kind of the shortcut. Community builds trust and trust yields revenue. So community yields revenue. And, you know, I have to say, by inviting people into a vibrant community, we're really giving them a gift. There are scores of studies that have shown that people who are involved with two or more nonprofit missions have actually have a lower risk of mortality. Uh, that's how important being involved in a community is. It, it, it literally can keep people alive longer. So I have a new friend, his name is Joshua, and Josh was the CEO at BWF, it's a consultancy. Um, Josh has not published this research yet, but he let us use it. Um, this is a, a study that um, BWF did of their clients, and here's some of what they heard back from their clients. Um, it's great, I love this organization, I really feel like I'm part of something, hoo-ha. Um, but then also, I'm kind of lonely. I only hear from them when they want something. I'm not sure my gifts matter compared to the big gifts. So as they dug down into this research, they found something really, really striking that lends to the conversation about community. When donors are friends with other donors, i.e. they're in a community, their lifetime value is four to five times higher. That's a big deal, that they're resilient during economic uncertainty also nice, but 
let me belabor the point, four to five times higher value lifetime wise, just because they're friends, when they're friends, that is community at work. The other data point that we have walked by for years without fully understanding is um, why teams raise more than individuals. And it is because of the community dynamic that we've been describing in this webinar. So we're gonna transition to a community, a real one, and we're gonna talk about it. But the first thing to lay down is that Facebook fundraising is peer to peer. It just is. And a peer to peer event is not a community. It just isn't. Talk more about that. Uh, PBTF's Facebook challenge spawned a community. It didn't start out that way, but it became that. And a uh, pediatric brain tumor was fortunate enough to have a couple of people on staff who looked at it, Emily and Ian, and said, whoa, this is something. So Emily, tell us about that. Absolutely. So, um, you know, at the time where we were all experiencing immense change um, in the way that we did business because um, we couldn't meet in person, we were an early adopter to these Facebook challenges. Um, and I was running them um, as a fundraiser. And we were doing one, you know, every sort of sort of every other month. And um, they were very transactional in nature. We, we, we did our things. We, we tried our best to post post that built, built community, but we were not seeing the return that we thought we would initially see. Right. Um, the one the, the, out, the people that outperformed others in terms of revenue or engagement um, within the group, though, were people that were um, uh, new to PBTF, but were in the brain tumor community. Um, and they found this as an avenue to really connect and do something um, meaningful um, with their journey. Or it was people that were known to PBTF, already members of our community, advocating for us inside the group. And those are the ones that tend, tend, um, tended to carry the, the weight and the load of our fundraising efforts in these groups. Uh, and so when we decided to ultimately pivot our walk program that we had and make it solely an online um, uh, fundraising experience, we really wanted that sense of community and that sense of um, investment in um, the families that we serve to be at the forefront of what we do. And so what we what we decided to do last year is um, uh, take what our old walk model was. We built it into an ad campaign um, challenge group, and we very specifically targeted markets where we saw, saw high um, levels of um, occurrences for brain tumor diagnoses. We, we targeted um, markets that didn't have a lot of resourcing um, or community engagement for families, um, and we targeted our own um, uh, known community members. We brought them all into this group together. And it, it, it started out as a fundraising group for Starry Night, our old walk program. Uh, uh, when we got into the group, we recognized that it was mostly families inside of that group. And so we were very, very specific um, about who we needed to have inside that group to facilitate conversations that can quite honestly be very um, sensitive. Um, a lot of the families coming to us were newly diagnosed. And so what we ended up doing is we placed our family support staff in there as the voice for um, this fundraising group. Um, and we did have fundraising stuff in there to sort of manage some of those tips, tricks, things like that, that come from a fundraising campaign. But really that took a back seat to the community building that was happening with our family support team. They were welcoming every um, participant as they came in. They were the ones that were directly connecting with them with their welcome packages. Um, the um, uh, private messaging that was happening between that team and the participants um, in order for families to receive support um, increased dramatically. So um, we saw that this group was a really, really fascinating way for us to start connecting with those that needed um, a network of support, care, and friendship. Excellent. So um, Mark and Otis, I would love for you to watch the chat because I'm sure people will have specific uh, questions about how this transition happens. So the original plan was we're going to do a Facebook challenge and that's going to be our pivot from the walk scenario. Uh -huh. you, split it up, you saw the fundraising happening. I think you had an initial success of about $80,000 in a month. 
Is that right? So we did. And that was, that was what was, fa- that's what we raised on um, Meta's platforms. Um, we also had two teams that were so sort of big um, uh, that were engaged in that group that we had to take them offline because they had in-person engagement opportunities and things like that. And they brought in the additional funds that you see there to equal 140, almost $142,000. So in effect, you could say that um, this Facebook fundraiser, the community that resulted from it spawned two significant DIY programs. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, and we're going to go through some screenshots of what's happening inside the community. But before we go there, you said that you brought your mission people, your mission support people into the group that had not been the original plan. And, right. Uh- well, we because we were targeting it, um, we did initially plan on doing that, but we didn't expect them to take such a such a lead voice in the group. Um, when we saw how many families were coming in, we were like, oh, th- this needs to be those two need to be the most vocal um, because these are families that are looking for something beyond just a way to give back. It was um, greater. The, the need was greater. Right. So you looked at it. You said, we're not shutting this down. We're going to leave it open. You'll leave it open indefinitely. I would guess yep, it's, it's open indefinitely. It's still very active. People are still joining it. Families are coming into the group daily. Um, it's a, it's a resource that we provide to families and honestly, other supporters that want to connect meaningfully. Um, we do, we do vet people to make sure that is a s- safe space, um, before entry, um, because it is so, um, made up of so many families, but, um, uh, it is open, it's robust and our family support team is in there every single day. How much um, energy and time does your paid staff uh, devote to this group? So um, really it's maintenance and it's being proactive to um, being present, Um, but it's not, um, I would say on average, maybe 30 minutes a day. Now I will say we have top leadership in that group, our CFO um, and um, uh, our our CEO who are in there and just talking to people. I don't even know if people know that how they're affiliated with PBTF because they're just giving support, care, and love without really mentioning who they are. Um, but we have uh, pretty much every team member that we have from leadership on down is in that group in some way or uh, shape or form um, showing up and communicating. Um, formally though, it's probably max 30 minutes a day for the family support team. That's really remarkable. Often, uh, you know, we study community a lot and um, we consider an online community just simply one place the community meets. So would you um, consider your online community inside Facebook to be that simply one place that your community meets? No. And what we're doing, we're leveraging that as a tool to connect people um, in the group, but also outside the group. The community is the people. The 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 group is simply um, a vehicle to bring them together for that day. But it really, it's the people. And what they're doing is they're spawning their own fundraisers and inviting each other. They're celebrating each other's successes outside of the group. Um, they're meeting up to support one another. Um, and then, like I said, they're also connecting with um, some really sort of um, uh meaningful support tools through our um, support groups outside of this um, and um, through um, some of the resourcing that we have in terms of our programs. So what will happen? I didn't prep you with this question. Sorry. Um, okay. What will happen when it's time to do another challenge? How yeah. will you deploy the technology and spin that up again? I was, can you repeat that? Sorry, I, I dropped. Yeah. How will you um, spin up another challenge inside the group. I think that you're using a panel to facilitate that. So we do. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So what we do now with our challenges is that because so many people, um, um, who participate and really do the bulk of the fundraising are connected to us. We market them organically. So we have marketed new channel, uh, challenges within the group around awareness uh, months. Um, with end of year coming up, we will offer opportunities for memorial um, uh, fundraising challenges. We'll offer um, opportunity for people to really engage um, through um, um, holiday giving through that, um, whether it's straight donations or fundraising. Um, but really that's not necessarily the goal that we have there. Um, what we want to do in there that tends to spawn more of the fundraising without us making the ask is fostering the relationship building. Um, and so when we are posting inside the group, it's more about, um, while there are some direct asks, um, it's really more about the programs that we have to offer and how they're benefiting other families who are participating in those. And then that tends to sort of generate organic, um, support outside of that. Got it. All right. Very good. 
Um, we're going to look now at some of what is happening inside the groups. Can you tell us about these posts? And, and again, what we're evaluating here is like, what does this community produce? This community is yeah. a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising effort. What is it producing now? So tell us about yeah. that. So as you can see, um, the group is really used to... Um, uh, generate conversation and relationship building. And so what we are seeing is that 90% um, of the posts that come through are generated by um, the community itself. We're not prompting, we're not asking the questions. It is questions that families are coming in to um, uh, ask. It's people sharing recurrences, diagnoses, ways that they've made it through their treatments. And here's um, someone asking some uh, simple recommendations for music that they can play before their child goes in. Um, for radiation and chemo, which can be very scary for a child. Um, and our CFO, who's got personal experience in this space, um, his son uh, 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 survived a brain tumor. He's uh, he's commenting as a parent and he's showing up for them um, in a meaningful way, um, just as a person to person. And then you can see other community members are, are ch um, chiming in. But the conversations really post to post are pretty robust. I love it. All right. What's happening here? So this one, I, I really love this one. This this gentleman has no relationship with um, brain tumor specifically. He himself is a cancer survivor, which brought him into the group. And he recognizes as, that the greater um, community as a whole can be a support. And he's offering his um, uh, support to, to these folks. He's fundraised for us um, as part of this um, experience, because um, what we see in, in many cases is that a Adults know the challenges that come with um, um, beating a brain tumor or um, surviving a brain tumor. Um, um, so they can't even fathom what that means for a child. And so we're seeing a lot of people who experience this in their own right um, really advocate for um, the families within um, our space. Love it. And what's happening here? So um, this is someone that is um, really experiencing some of the um, uh, repercussions that um, a lot of families experience in, in terms of mental health and wellness. Um, parents um, uh, often put themselves on the back burner in terms of um, uh, receiving care. And so here it is, is here we have someone that is um, really asking for support and help um, with their own mental wellness within this group and putting themselves um, as a priority in the care of their child. Um, and she's doing that in a way that um, is generating care and support for her. And the, 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 the group is really showing up for her and giving her words of encouragement that us as staff members could never, like we've not, most of us have not been there in that position. Um, because they have this shared experience that is very unique to a small number of people, um, they're able to say, I see you, I've been there, um, and here's what I have to offer you in terms of a relationship. Um, so we're, we, we love seeing that f facilitation of conversation and care that's coming directly from members. Love it. I'm gonna stop you for a moment. And Otis, Otis um, these people who are interacting with each other, whether they fundraised or not, what's happening to them psychologically? Well, you know, I love the example, of the, <clears throat> excuse me, that Emily said, this person doesn't even have an experience with pediatric brain tumor. Mm -hmm. He's being validated. It doesn't matter if he has experience, you know, who he yeah. is is being validated through interacting with this group. It's this social validation feedback loop mm -hmm. that I was talking about. The more he interacts, the more his identity is, 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 uh, is validated, which makes it more likely for him to want to come back because it's just highly rewarding. You know, uh, Americans in particular in the world are just extremely isolated. We live in this incredibly isolated uh, society. And so here's this channel for this person to tap into these relationships mm -hmm. and have himself validated. It's just, you know, it's it, it just, again, it's, it's very, very rewarding to people. So let me ask you, uh, I promised Joe wouldn't blindside you with questions, but I can't help it. Um, <laughs> yes, I know. He's been under general anesthesia four times this year, so this will be like double backflip. It's always an adventure now. <laughs> yes. Okay, so um, I, I love what you're saying about the fellow who does not have experience with brain cancer, but the the parents who are talking here, um, clearly they're making relationships with each other. What does that mean to Pediatric Brain Tumor Foundation? What does that mean to it? The fact that they're in this group making relationships with each other what does that mean to the Pediatric Brain Tumor Foundation? Oh, well, you know, what they're doing is they're they're building trust. And as, and as, as I said earlier, 
Trust is something that's actionable. You know, now these people that are engaged in these relationships, imagine if someone gives them a call one time and says, hey, I'm, I'm a volunteer for PDTF. Um, uh, you know, we've got this new fundraising drive coming up. Can I count on you to uh, be a part of that? You know, we're really excited about it. You think they're going to say no? Of course they're going to say yes. You know, it's just, you know, you you were asking Emily about, well, what about when the next fundraising event comes? Mm -hmm. You know, fundraising events are just things that happen within the normal mm -hmm. cycle of the community. They begin and they end. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, it, it's very different than, than the usual um, uh, the usual model for uh, uh, for a nonprofit where the event is the only thing that brings this community together, you know, mm -hmm. um, and and then when the event's over they dissipate or whatever and we have to reacquire people and so forth for next year. Uh, this is a very different situation where you know and and a fundraising event is just one thing in the life cycle of of of, of the community. They're doing many many things, um, so. You know, uh, participating is just something that these people are going to very, very likely that they're going to do. So that's why I said I might want to run that poll again, because the way we've defined community is as an everlasting beast and also as more than just my email list. We've defined it as a living, breathing thing that's happening all the time. And a walk or a challenge is just a moment in that community. Mm -hmm. It is not the community. And as Emily said, the community is the group of people, not the event, not the Facebook challenge. It is the group of people. Ooh, you guys made those points so much more efficiently than I did. All right, let's look at the next one. What's happening here, Emily? So I love this one. Um, this is actually um, one of our um, past walk participants who, when we pivoted to this, she really embraced this online community. She does a lot of her sharing on Facebook, um, on her personal page. She joined this group, though, and really was a strong voice from the, the, the beginning and, and helped us create this safe space. She's now graduating college. And what she this is her, her cap for her college graduation that she placed all the names of every um, other child that she's connected with through her journey on her cap for her graduation, sharing it in the group and just seeing the support for her. And this is a, this is a young woman that is, um, needs that kind of validation and support um, in her life. And it, it's a confidence builder for her. So to have that kind of avenue to really um, thrive in as a, as a survivor and to see other people championing, championing her as she's also honoring the journey of so many. It's such a secular relationship where one is feeding into another and they're just building um, each other up in such profound ways. So we love, I love when she posted this. Love it. All right. And what's this guy? So this is a guy, this is Anthony, and he is a, a kid who the last couple of years has really taken charge of his, uh, being an advocate for himself and other kids and has um, created really incredible um, community fundraising activities outside of the group. So he he does jujitsu jiu jiu also, <laughs> um, and he does a tournament for us um, that raises money um, for um, the PBTF and some other organizations. So um, when he first um, joined the group, he made some headlines in his community for walking 51 miles um, uh, in honor of the group and um, the other kids that um, are all on the same journey as him. I love it. All right. And so he was also an advocate. So you're feeding. Yes, oh, exactly. That's great. And then what is this one? So this is um, one of my most favorites. Um, this is a young gentleman. His name is Danny. He is a senior in high school. Um, he um, found the group right at time of diagnosis. And um, they did a little lantern lighting ceremony. Um, and they also saw another member of our community, Bryant Young, who is a, a NFL um Hall of Famer, his son passed away. He they simultaneously to the group saw him speak. Um, we're very moved to, to be a part of what we do. Um, and um, Danny decided that he really wanted to um, make a difference for other kids. And within a matter of a week, started a golf fundraiser. Golf is his passion. Um, and he um, raised $15,000 um, in three days. <laughs> Um, surprising us all, um, including himself. And he is just, uh, he's doing incredible things with his story and his journey. And in fact, he just came back to us and asked us to, um, to write his college recommendation letters, which for us means the world because it's so validating 
um, in the, for the trust that they have placed in us and the community that we've built for them. Um, he's, he's literally trusting us with his next step of his life. Um, and so that just meant the world to us that he, he's getting so much out of our community that he's able to come and um, um, feel like we, he, we can be trusted in that way. So, hey, Emily, Emily, we had a question in the chat I'd like to pose. Oh, to yes. you. Said, is there ever any worry about people giving medical <laughs> advice that may not be appropriate or negative messaging? And, and if so, uh, how does that get handled in groups like this, the ones you're describing? So um, that's a great, great question. That is the number one reason why we have our family support team um in, in the group, um, we don't um, we we don't allow handing out of of medical advice per se, um, and so what we do, our family support team will will intervene and um, they'll kindly you know say hey let's connect offline um, and redirect both parties the person asking and then the person maybe sharing and just say hey listen this is the, this, these are the parameters of the group um, we're not medical professionals so we're not qualified to hand out medical um, advice. Um, and they are very kind and very caring in how they deliver those messages when they need to. Um, uh, so it is monitored and it is dealt with, but it's dealt with in a really respectful, kind um, way. Excellent. And one-on-one. -on -one. So. Very good. All right. Tell us about this fellow. So this is this is um, the same um, one of the same boys that we he, he, he's friends with the other boy who does the walk and he got a lot of uh, press when he was doing the walk program for us. He walked 52 miles himself. He his social media um, uh, posts during the time that he was doing the walk um, portion were um, it was every day and he was posting them in the group, um, sharing them with his entire community. And so he really made this his mission to become an advocate for PBTF um, by using this. Um, um, this group and this um, opportunity. Um, and so he garnered a lot of press um, from his experiences with us, um, which was really fun to see. Um, and yeah, he's been, he's been a really, really great. Um, he's shared our, his story with our, uh, you know, emails and social media too. So he's been really, really open and great with, with that. But yeah, it's just so incredible to see the kids in particular um, taking on um, the torch of finding a cure and advocating for themselves. They blow my mind that um, they have that sort of um, um, strength and intelligence um, to know that like this is their calling at such a young age. It's 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 phenomenal to see. Excellent. All right, last screenshot of what's happening inside the group. Yeah. So this is also an opportunity for us when we have some support resources for us to really connect with families one on one. And so our family support team is inside of there um, and they're posting um, uh, uh, tools and resources, including our support groups. So not only are people coming to this group to build relationships with one another, they're also taking it um, into other spaces where they're they're growing other communities and they're building more relationships. And so our family support team really offers opportunity in here without uh, not necessarily poaching people out of the group. We want to keep them here, but we also want to make sure that they know that there might be other relationships that may be of value to you. And we offer support groups for Spanish speaking populations, for um, bereavement, for siblings. And so we really try to give full scope of service um, uh, uh, so that they understand that there's more to our PBTF community and we can build a bigger, broader one for them as well outside of this. I love it. All right. So we're going to go back to the community being a shared idea and a way to communicate with each other. And one of the things we like to think about at Turnkey is like, okay, um, how are we doing it now? You know, what's happening now? So Otis, can you talk a little bit about this? Oh, I didn't tell you. I was going to make you talk about it, did I? No, that's fine. <laughs> no, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, so these are the four types of communications uh, in kind of in the nonprofit world. You know, you've got the organization to 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 the members. You've got the member to the organization. Uh, you've got the members to the outsider. That's like P two P fundraising or advocacy, and then you've got you know member to uh, member uh, communications. So so what do we spend the most time and money doing? Um, it's the first one. You know, organization to member. Uh, when they reply, we we you know we celebrate right. And we spend a lot of time um, in social fundraising, getting them to reach outside, uh, to do peer-to-peer, -to, -peer, to advocate. Um, but you know, remember these strong, uh, you know, building a strong sense of identity is what keeps constituents engaged with us 
uh, with the organization for 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 a number of purposes uh, that some of which Emily has talked about: donating, fundraising, volunteering, uh, acquisition. So, you know, where should we spend our time? What kind of communications will give us the strongest identity building? Um, it's member to member. It, it's the one that, that we usually spend the least time on. And this is going to kind of maybe sound like an extreme statement, but you know, I, I really believe that the most important thing that you can do to build community is to foster these one-to-one -one relationships between the members. Um, if that's your number one priority, what's going to happen is you're going to raise more money. And Emily's uh, uh, organization is, is just you know, a good example of, of how that works. Agreed. Um, it, it's striking to me that we spend the least amount of money on the thing that will, in the long run, in terms of lifetime value, produce the most. And there's some reasons that we do that, um, that we are going to jump into at this point. But before I do that, what I want to do is just kind of broad stroke it. We've talked about a complex symbiotic ecosystem in PBTF. Like you are able to accomplish it for some very specific reasons. Mm -hmm. It's tough. So if you're not PBTF, um, you know, how do you approach this? And just in incredibly broad strokes, this is what we recommend. Number one, understand community. The word has been rendered almost completely useless by our use of it, because we use the word community as if there's no process, there's no system, there's no metric attached to it. And there is. I wish maybe you know, over a long weekend with a lot of Sauvignon Blanc, we'll come up with a new word and we're going to define it so that we understand that it is um, a word of science and math and not of um, pure emotion. So understand what community is. And then once you have, evaluate where you are in comparison to your definition of community. Where are we? And then where are we, where are we going to get to? If we are um, investing, as an example, um, less than 1% of our budget in community building and fostering relationships between the people affected by our mission or who care about our mission, you know, what's it going to be next year? 5%? How are we going to do that? How do we cross the silos, which is a big part of the conversation because there is conflict. Emily, you know, it sounds like everybody over there is just kumbaya because you guys <laughs> cross in silos wide open every day. And I know the reason for that. Yeah. Most organizations that's not true. Yeah. Once you've braced for your conflict and you've worked through it, then you can nourish the community by doing more, better, faster, all of it. Um, Emily, you lean in wherever you want. Yeah. Um, we know, looking at other organizations, that silos are one of the main reasons that we don't build community. You went from what was a, an, a pivot during COVID to do peer-to-peer -peer fundraising with gift panel on Facebook. Yeah. And now you've crossed into advocacy. You've crossed yep. into delivery. You've crossed every boundary. Why is that? Uh, because if we're doing our job right, we every single person in our organization should be touching an individual. And so we, we have key leadership that really supports this idea that um, we want to take a holistic approach um, with um, our constituents and our supporters and our community members so that um, we all sort of have a recognition of where they fall within our space. And everyone that needs to be touching them is touching them. Um, when we first started these community, these um, Facebook challenge groups, it was solely me and um, either a volunteer or an intern or a consultant that I would um, um, pay to be in there. And it just wasn't effective for us. Um, we, there was a lot of misses in terms of support opportunities, relationship building. And so um, uh, it, the way that we just kind of work internally anyways is that um, there's always someone from every department and every team working collaboratively together on any given project. We've also moved my position under the same department that mission experience is in. So I'm working hand in hand with our advocacy director, our family support teams, and our research teams on, on the same team so that we can create a holistic sort of uh, 360 approach to how we engage um, every person that comes across the PBTF. Yeah. Um, so one of the interesting stories we've heard about breaking down silos is that mm -hmm. ultimately the outbound communications get really messy. You know, yeah. when the peer-to-peer -peer people are controlling all the communications in regard to their 
event and then major gifts is controlling their people and their communications and middle giving and all that, that it feels very good to us, right? We know where all the pieces are. Um, to the constituent, it might not be very good. Um, do you think that drives the silo? Just Oh, a, a million percent. And, and um, that was part of the challenge on the initial launch of this group was that it was run um, or seen as a transition from our peer-to-peer -peer traditional programming. And so we did have that, that sort of um, coming together as a team to figure out what this was going to be, but everyone had their role. So our peer-to-peer -peer team was in the group, but their focus was on communications that really specifically dealt with fundraising. Mm -hmm. um, and family support was able to see very transparently what they were doing and vice versa. So we were always playing off of one another. Our, our post calendar shared, everyone knew what was going out there in terms of our outbound communications. Um, and then we were able to supplement and co complement each other in terms of what we were offering to our um, community. So it sounds like um, control was shared, but also yes. your, perform your personal performance metrics, there was some flexibility there. It wasn't all about revenue. I mean, you're yeah. spending a significant, uh, well, actually less than I would have guessed, but still significant amount of time fostering the community. How do you put a metric on that? How do you, how do you, how does somebody on listening to us sell this to their boss? So, you know, that's a hard one because some people are, especially when you work in the world of fundraising, there's always this kind of this bounty over your head of a dollar amount that you have to raise. Um, and when we look at sort of longevity of people engaging with us and um, the number of people that are coming together and and what they're doing beyond that initial point of contact, that those are all measurables too for us. Um, we are really looking at how how are we how have we been able to sustain this group? How many new families were we able to bring in and build relationships with? Um, the all those metric metrics are important. They're all valuable to the success of this group. And just because someone doesn't activate today doesn't mean they're not going to activate. Um, a month from now. And so what we do is we really are playing the long game here. It's not about um, an immediate transac a transactional experience for us. It is um, about deep, meaningful connection and growth within um, this group. Um, so while yes, there's things that we have to <laughs> bring in, um, we also can leverage things like sponsors to help with that. We've also let leverage some other kind of financial things so that this group can be what it's intended to be, which is a space of care and support. And um, I didn't ask you if you guys yeah. do that, but my, my guess is you mentioned, you know, revenue is the, sometimes the only net revenue is the only performance metric that anybody gets judged on. Yeah. It sounds like in your organization, lifetime value is more important. Uh Yes, absolutely. We're looking at um, at those who want to reactivate in the future. We know that specifically with us in our space, that what a family experiences on a day to day can change like that, and that there may be a time that they have to walk away from um, providing that kind of support, but they may be back down the line. And so we're really looking, like I said, at that that holistic picture of, of who they are to us in the long run, and not just a number um, on my KPIs, um, at the end of the year. So, you know, everything that you and I've been talking about, I know was able to happen mm -hmm. for one reason, and that is because your CEO is behind you all the way in community in creating community. A million percent. This is uh, Courtney Davies. She is our CEO and, uh, uh, she came from the world of JDRF. So many people know her. Um, but she is fantastic in terms of breaking down silos. She's the first person to say, we need to bring everyone to the table and every voice needs to be heard in this. Um, community is at the core of what we do and specifically community within, um, uh, our families. Um, we all we call our families our North Star, um, and that is because they their needs and building um, uh, building this web and network of people who can lift them up and support them is critical in everything that she does, um, and it is vital um, in the work that we do. So we we lead with that with with everything, and it's all because she's given us. Um, that she's built that example for us. And on top of that, one of the other greater gifts that she's given us is the room to fail and to test. Um, the reason we're able to get to this point is because turnkey, we worked with turnkey very early on when 
challenges came to the U.S. And she's like, let's test this. Let's let's take a risk on this right now. Um, and that has grown into this. And so I think having a CEO who understands the value in um, taking calculated risks um, and is also supportive of that collaborative sort of environment is so critical to what we've been able to do. I love it. Okay, presenters, get ready for your heads to be much larger because I'm staring right now uh, because I want to see the chat. Um, so, in the absence of pertinent questions, but I want to ask you guys: Does community building mean the same thing to you right now that it meant at the beginning of this presentation? Would you answer your questions the same way? Let us know in the chat how you feel about community at this point. So, I'll give you a moment for that. I'm also curious about whether you think your CEO needs to be brought into the conversation in a similar manner as Emily's CEO. Would they be supportive? Would they understand the conversation? Would they be able to connect a uh, more uh, metric-based driving of community in order to support other initiatives in order to take you out of your silo? Do you think that could happen? There is a question from Alex in the Q and A. How does this community for the uh, sorry? How does this community for this uh, virtual event compare to communities you build for in person events? It's a great question. Can I um, before I before you answer? I'm going to challenge the premise of the question. Emily, would you say that you can differentiate between those two communities? Uh, absolutely. I, so, um, in terms of this community. It goes beyond surface. Oftentimes when we're in that event space, and I can compare this mostly to our, our largest fundraising event, which is our Ride for Kids program, right? That's made up of motorcyclists that go and ride for the day. Their experience with PBTF is almost exclusively in that moment and in that day, because it's a very specific niche sort of activity that they're doing. And they're there mostly for the activity and the camaraderie of riders, but they're not connecting beyond their own ride group. They're not connecting beyond, they see each other once a year, hug each other, and then they kind of leave until the next year. This is ongoing and, and it is, um, they're constantly getting updates. They're constantly connecting. They're constantly um, providing support and, and sharing um, stories of where they're at. When there's immense loss that's experienced through um, the passing of a child, they are the first, this is one of the first places that family will come because this is the group that's going to get it. And this is the group that's going to be able to say, I can go deep with you in a way that no one else can. Um, and um, some of those other communities that we have are sort of more um, generated by a passion for an activity as opposed to a passion for the PBTF community. So it's just a little bit more meaningful um, and honestly, I believe sustainable long-term. Very good. All right, Mark, two minutes. Um, I will turn it back to you. All right. Well, thanks, Katrina, Otis, Emily. That was great stuff. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We still have a couple of sessions later today, um, so feel free to join us for those. And if you missed any of this uh, or if you want to listen to it again, we will be sending out links to both the deck and to the recording. So um, thank you all so much for uh, your time today and have a terrific day. Thank you, thank you guys. Bye-bye.